So it's a real uh, pleasure and delight to have uh, Jakob joining us this week. Um, I had, had the uh, pleasure of, of talking about these things over lunch um, in Basel uh, not too long ago. And, and we actually met uh, uh, on Zoom. Um, I, I gave a talk early in the pandemic and we started talking about Whitehead. And I figured that if uh, there was a veterinary scientist who was literate in Whitehead, this is definitely someone who uh, I want to be friends with and establish ongoing conversations and collaborations with. Um, so Jakob has offered us a, a number of really stimulating papers to read for today. And um, in kind of a break, from how we often do things in the reading group, uh, he's offered to give us a PowerPoint just to kind of sum up, um, you know, his understanding of, of where we are in the pandemic. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the narrative, at least in my mind, has, has shifted in, in the last couple of weeks since, since we had lunch in Basel with this paper publishing in, in Italy, suggesting that, you know, possibly as early as September 2019, SARS-CoV-2 was, was circulating in Europe. So, yeah. Um, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on these these possible shifting timelines and shifting uh, geographies. Um, but yeah, if, if you could just uh, go ahead and give us give us an overview of of where you see things are uh, standing now. Yeah. Well, um, um, my name is Jakob Zinstag. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist, and I uh, lift. We, I lived with my family for eight years in West Africa, in the Gambia and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so I, uh, and since then I'm at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute and I have a research group that is called um, Human and Animal Health. And um, actually uh, I was asked to build up a research group that looked at the health of mobile pastoralists in Chad from a veterinary perspective, because these people live with their animals, but they have virtually no health care for, for themselves. So that's when I remembered um, Calvin Schwabe, that veterinary epi American veterinary epidemiologist who coined the term one medicine, uh, who argues that there is no difference in paradigm between the two medicines except the species, and um, that there should be, be benefits from, from such a cooperation. And I would say, if you don't keep anything from what I say tonight, keep that in mind. I am looking after benefits from a closer cooperation uh, between human and animal health. And um, that has uh, critical ramifications into philosophy, into philosophy of science, into um, uh, actually uh, game theory uh, and so on. We, I think we will come by. Then I am in the lucky position to live with a Protestant uh, church minister since 38 years. And actually it's always the books that are on her desk that I grab and that inspire me profoundly. So I uh, confess here that uh, <laughs> my wife uh, 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 talked to me about process theology uh, for the first time, and then I got into process philosophy and into Alfred North Whitehead. And uh, then it was also um, a book by Alfred Novak, uh, evolutionary mathematician, that ro who wrote a book with uh, Sarah Coakley, uh, um, an Anglican theologian in Cambridge, um, who, who wrote a book together about cooperation. It's called uh, Evolution, Games, and God. Um, I, um, I can quickly show it to you here. Let me see if it appears. Yeah. And um, so uh, uh, I think when I started my studies, I, I was torn between um, philosophy, theology, physics, and chemistry. And I loved working on the farms of my family. So that's uh, at the end, I became a vet, but my epiphany was when I understood that we could do mathematical models about infectious disease. And I wrote some of the first models of human and uh, human animal transmission, the first one on brucellosis and the first one on rabies. And um, the luck, the other luck I have is that I work at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, 
we are 800 people uh, and 60 nations and about 30 disciplines. So I can basically go to anybody that I need, uh, mathematicians, statisticians, economists, molecular biologists, but also very much anthropologists. Actually, the anthropologist that influenced me most is Brigitte Obrist. She wrote mm. uh, important papers on access to healthcare, but also on socially layered resilience. So this is a, a little bit my, my background. And um, I, I firmly believe that there is only one science. Uh, we are just uh, humans on one little planet in the universe. And I, I, I don't accept that we should split into disciplinary um, uh, realms. I, 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 I don't accept that. But to prove that it makes sense to work between disciplines, we must show the benefits from working together. And we have to do this as quantitatively as possible or as qualitatively as possible. So um, today, to be concise, I would like to show you the importance of looking through a One Health lens on COVID. Because uh, ironically, that is mostly um, ignored. And uh, I mean, are you aware that in Denmark, we just had a genocide? 25 million minks were just killed. Nobody speaks about it. But it is, <laughs> if, we, if we look at this from a co-creational uh, perspective, this is a holocaust for the minks, just like that. So how can we as humans be so disrespectful to our co-creatures? So, <laughs> so let me start quickly. And I, I send you all the material. These are lectures that are more voluminous. And, and we, I will concentrate on the essentials. But if you pick slides that you want me to comment, just tell me. I think Rachel can share them with you, the, full, the, the PDFs. So let me quickly go into it. Um, now, uh, what I present you here is uh, done by an uh, intern, uh, Susanne Gutruf, who spent with me two months in April, May. And she, um, let me just go to this slide here. She um, worked up actually the, the phylogenetics of, of coronaviruses. And there are four groups, four main groups, and the uh, so-called alpha, beta, uh, gamma, and delta groups. And I just walk you briefly through it. That is essential biological knowledge that we should have. So we have the, sorry, um, so we, in the delta group, we have a porcine, a pig virus. Not so important. Then we have uh, chicken viruses, the, the gamma group, and then we have the alpha group. And in the alpha group, you have two human, two human viruses, and then you have some other pig and a cat virus. And you see already here among this almost uh, I think that it's it's almost a hundred species. Only five are really human adapted. All the others is wildlife or livestock. And uh, for Rachel, I hope your cat is vaccinated against FIP, that's feline infectious peritonitis. But feline infectious peritonitis is an alpha coronavirus. And that is for me a reason why probably cats are susceptible to coronavirus uh, more than dogs, because the dog uh, coronaviruses, they are in the beta group, as you will just see. So in the beta group, we have MERS. Uh, we, MERS is, um, uh, ha has come up in the Middle East. It was found in camels and jumped to humans. And MERS is potentially dangerous for humans. I mean, it is is also acute respiratory syndrome. Um, the main feature of acute respiratory syndromes is that it thickens the alveolar me uh, membrane and then the oxygen can no longer go through. 
And that's why you need uh, respiration, artificial respiration. So MERS is a dangerous virus. We are currently looking at it in Ethiopia, in the Somali region of Ethiopia. And then you have SARS-CoV-1. You see here the beta, you see my mouse? You see my mouse. So you see here the um, SARS-CoV, uh, this is the SARS virus from 2003. That was actually detected the first time in Canada in, in the Winnipeg laboratory. And the closest uh, animal ancestry is the civet uh, coronavirus. Uh, and the SARS-CoV-2 is genetically in the same uh, uh, group and very, very close to SARS-CoV-1. And then the other members of the beta group are the bovine respiratory vi uh, coronavirus, the canine respiratory coronavirus, another bovine coronavirus, and human cough OC43, and the porcine hemagglutinating encephalitis virus. Phylogenetically, it, is, it can be shown that the human coronavirus OC43 has evolved from the bovine respiratory, respiratory coronavirus around 1830, something like that, not long ago. So what I want to tell you is that picture is that humans and animals are inextricably linked with coronaviruses. And um, there is uh, going <laughs> uh, through and through, uh, as we actually see with that mink story in Denmark and, and the Netherlands. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, one hypothesis we had with that is that, and that, that was a, an a anecdotal um, idea because a cousin of my wife is a farmer and he said, you know, Jakob, I, we will not have that virus, the, the, the COVID. And uh, because we, we have the coronaviruses in the cattle. And indeed, when I studied veterinary medicine, for me, Corona and rotaviruses were very familiar. This is what I learned when I studied. So the bovine coronavirus, actually 40% of the Swiss cattle are seropositive for the bovine coronavirus. So our idea is that people who would be exposed to cattle or dogs uh, who have active uh, their own coronavirus infection could possibly be exposed in a way that they would be immune protected partially uh, against COVID-19. So that was a, that, this question you can answer is a simple case control study. And we submitted this to Swiss National Science Foundation. It was rejected. So um, actually, this is where we are. But I want you to be aware that uh, coronaviruses are uh, a, really an important zoonotic issue, but it seems that they are not class two, but class four pathogens. I will come to that quickly. This means you don't have continuous transmission, like in rabies or in brucellosis, you have probably a singular transmission to humans, and from there it, it's transmitted uh, between humans. Uh, we, we just come to that classification. So this is the first input I wanted to give you so that you are aware how closely human and animals are linked in the, in the, uh, in the corona issue, in the COVID issue. And that has important consequences because the bulk of research at the moment is going into vaccine research and into drugs. But very few people ask themselves, how do we actually prevent the next pandemic? Because what is for me at the origin of that biosafety issue or biosecurity issue is not solved. And I show you why. Because we still have uh, animal production under very poor biosecurity conditions, animal transport, animal slaughtering, anim animal marketing under terrible conditions. I, I, I will just show you. 
So what I suggest, let me finish that block on Corona and then we start the discussion. Is that okay? Yeah. So um, here is again the summary uh, highlighted the closeness of SARS-CoV-2 and animal coronaviruses that are circulating in definitely in Europe. I don't know to which extent they are circulating in the US. Yeah. Now, um, I skip that because that just shows um, you have the references that shows the immunological closeness. I mean, the um, nucleoproteins of coronaviruses, uh, of animal and human coronaviruses are uh, really, really close. And that is an argument why there could be a partial cross protection if you are exposed to animal viruses of the beta group, definitely. So I skip that and I go, so this is a paper we just published um, in October. And here you see the classification of zoonotic pathogens. And I mentioned class two pathogens. These are those that are continuously transmitted from animals to humans, but have animal reservoirs, but are not transmitted between humans. So rabies is an example, bovine TB. Uh, no, it's not a good example, but brucellosis is definitely a good example. And then, uh, pathogen class four are those that jump once over to humans and then they are transmitted uh, uh, between humans. The classic about that is HIV AIDS. I mean, HIV AIDS probably jumped over from a simian, uh, 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 simian monkey to a, to a human when they were fleecing or butchering monkeys somewhere in, cent in, in Congo. We don't know exactly, but that's a likely scenario. And from there, it, 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 it transmitted between humans. So SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, SARS and COVID-19 is a class four uh, pathogen or a stage four pathogen. So um, this is now just to give you that uh, definition that I mentioned before, and I say again, if you don't keep anything from my talk, um, remember that one health is for us really to prove an incremental benefit of a closer cooperation. If doctors and vets, they can each work in their corner, um, but if they work, they can make animals and human healthy, but if they work together, they can make more animals and human healthy as they could ever do alone, and they can save money and um, they could probably better sustain uh, ecosystems um, services. So this is what we want to demonstrate. And uh, I, I mean, COVID is again a fantastic example for it. And I address it through the issue of surveillance and actually uh, preventing the next pandemic. And um, this is uh, the cover of our uh, book that just uh, uh, appeared as in the second edition last month also. And uh, it is also available as an ebook. And uh, so I, I jumped this one because I want to give you one example uh, how One Health works. Now, this is about the stage two pathogen. Uh, Rabies in dogs is continuously transmitted by the bite by animals, uh, dogs biting humans. And you can protect humans by post exposure prophylaxis. You can vaccinate them and then they would, will not get ill. And the cost of that is accumulating continuously. That's the dotted line, uh, PEP alone. And um, because why is it accumulating? Because the reservoir is not in the human. If, if, if you protect humans, that cost keeps accumulating. The reservoir is in the dog. So if you mass vaccinate dogs, and this is the evidence we have, you have higher incremental cost initially because you have to mass vaccinate dogs. But if it is not reintroduced in that area, 
this, that slope is um, uh, growing slower than the other slope. And you come to break even after about six years. So we argue after 10 years, the cumulative cost of intervening in the reservoir and in humans is lower than just increment, uh, uh, investing in, in humans alone. So you need an integrated approach of vaccinating dogs and uh, protecting humans. That will be the solution because you, you interrupt transmission and you can eliminate the disease. But if you stick only to humans, that is what currently the mainstream is doing. You, you just have accumulating costs, but you don't solve the problem. Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance at the moment, although it promised to invest into human post-exposure prophylaxis, just put everything, everything on hold on hold and says, let us wait until COVID is over to continue this. But this is, this is terrible. It is unacceptable. And I also told Gavi that at the end, if they don't invest into dog mass vaccination, they, they will never solve the problem. And their response was, this is no, not in our strategy. And here I, I'm so happy to have a, a political scientist in the, in, the, in the audience. This is a big institutional issue. I mean, the, the medical sector and the public health sector is just colorblind. I mean, they, <laughs> I don't know, they, they are just so focused with blinkers on their own public health things and don't think that many problems in the world are systemic and can only be solved if we take a systemic approach. Anyway, this talk is not only about One Health, but I, I wanted to show you how we work. These are the kind of comparative economical analysis that we do. They are based on mathematical models uh, of animal-human transmission. These mathematical models can be as sophisticated as contact network topologies, or they, they can be metapopulation models or simple differential equation models. We don't waste our time with that, but just that there is a solid data base behind on, for that. Now, let us go back um, to integrated surveillance. And interestingly, this is a old, relatively old schematic that came from the Institute of Medicine that came, was taken up by the World Bank. And it symbolizes the linkage of humans, wildlife and ani domestic animals in, in the emergence of zoonotic disease. And the World Bank says, basically, the earlier you detect the pathogen and you act, the less is the cumulative cost. So this is symbolized by this red line. And the longer you wait until it, you have it in domestic wildlife, uh, in domestic animals <laughs> or in humans, the costs are just exploding. And I mean, with COVID, we have a fantastic example for that. But the COVID curve, I mean, it's out of the screen. I mean, it's <laughs> so much higher than what you would expect. So the point is, if we would have an integrated surveillance system that would identify zoonosis already in wildlife and communicate it between the veterinary and public health system, then the public health system can be informed and can prevent the transmission by better biosecurity, by other means, by uh, better awareness and whatsoever. And <clears throat> but the reality is that most surveillance systems in the world today are um, sectorial. They are either veterinary surveillance systems or human surveillance systems. There are very few systems that are really coupled. One very good um, uh, example um, is the West Nile, virus, West Nile virus surveillance in Italy, in Emilia Romagna, actually. And they look at mosquitoes, wild birds, horses, and humans in the same time. And they can show savings because they communicate between the veterinary and public health side. And they can prevent that 
potentially contaminated blood is given to patients uh, with, with West Nile. And um, so this is where, where it should go. And that has important institutional and operational consequences. So our, our current analysis um, uh, of the international health regulations of the World Health Organization and of the so-called PVS, this is the Performance of Veterinary Service reports, show that there is an increasing number of countries that mention One Health as an approach that should be taken uh, to prevent outbreaks, uh, uh, to prevent zoonotic outbreaks. So our vision, and uh, that, that's now a political issue, and my, my point is, we don't need new ministries. Um, all the ministries are good and well institutionalized, but we need them to cooperate better. I mean, there is nothing worse than struggling about budgets between ministries. This is absolutely terrible. But we must reach a better cooperation. So our vision is that if we can, if we can operationalize um, One Health governance, then uh, and inform each other about emerging outbreaks, that red curve can be flattened. And the ultimate vision of that is that whenever there would be a new risk of, a, of an emerging zoonosis, the integrated surveillance is so good and so powerful that it can immediately inform about new outbreaks and measures can be taken at either already at the level of wildlife or at the level of domestic animals and, and um, uh, definitely at the human level. Now, that's not the end of the story because uh, often drastic, drastic interventions in, into animals can destroy livelihoods. And um, we have seen this with the avian influenza outbreak in and already in 2005, I, I wrote, ah, here is actually the West Nile virus example uh, by Julia Paternoster and colleagues. Um, and, uh, but let me go, and, and here is, uh, this is our own research in, in Adadle Woreda in the Somali region, where we have a veterinary officer uh, and a public health officer sitting in the same room and sharing their information. And they told us that they had abortions in animals and they warned the people not to eat, drink the milk and not to touch the aborted bodies because this could be Rift Valley fever. And, um, and we, this is also how we organize uh, village women. If they put money together every month, they can pay ambulance services if they need it because most of the time there is no fuel for the car. So, if this money is available, they they can they can significantly significantly enhance the the probability that they can have an emergency service. But that's another another discussion we can have another time. Uh, for, uh, not to forget all the anthropological issues around that and linguistic issues around that. But this citation here I made in 2005. This was the first paper that mentioned One Health in the biomedical literature in, in Lancet. And we say, we, of course, we need research in vaccines and drugs, but we need also a better biosecurity of the uh, animal production. And uh, we need a better uh, consideration of the whole wildlife issues with, um, with uh, emerging zoonosis. And uh, uh, we we want to do that in a way that we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, involve these people to find practical solutions to avoid uh, impeding poverty from these measures. And that's my last point on that section. Um, first of all, uh, this is the reality. I mean, you see the battery chicken production in China. This is China. This is, I think, Vietnamese. This is, again, Chinese pictures. This is the reality, and this is unacceptable from a humane point of view, in as much as from a virological or bacteriological point of view. So here, these are 
the big changes that we have all to work on. And this is why I plead for a global partnership with all these countries who still sustain this kind of animal production in, uh, in an inhumane and uh, uh, poor biosecurity way. I mean, uh, uh, this is totally inhumane to keep animals like that, uh, uh, like here uh, and, and in these batteries. And uh, the risk of transmission of, of uh, viruses is tremendous. And then forget about the live animal markets and the slaughtering of animals in, the, in those markets. Um, the, that's the source of, that, that's a main source of uh, future pandemics. Plus, actually the much stronger consideration of wildlife. But how can we go there? I mean, to make changes in such systems, you cannot just come in as an epidemiologist or as a virologist and say, we do this and that. This has to be negotiated. So we need, uh, we need actually a participatory approach that co-produces transformational knowledge uh, to solve societal problems. And this is the definition of what we call transdisciplinary research. I'm the president of the transdisciplinary network of the Swiss academies, and this is what we promote. And I can show it to you here. These are participatory stakeholder meetings. This here is on the Lake Chad. This is 100 kilometers north of Timbuktu in 2006, and we bring together decision makers, scientists, and concerned population. Wonderful playground for anthropologists. <laughs> and and um, first of all, we have to create trust. We have to make sure that people really are willing to talk to each other. Often these are iterations of plenary sessions and focal groups. So we bring together, this here is the chief veterinarian of Chad. These are the political authorities of Timbuktu, the chief medical officer of Timbuktu, the communities and the, the scientists here. So, and if, if you are able to have such a meeting going, uh, such, uh, in my experience, nearly all the time, those who are never listened, the women, those who don't want to speak in public, come up with the best solutions. And these are solutions that we cannot develop at an academic desk. They emerge actually literally in such meetings. There is an incredible uh, group dynamics and also, uh, uh, how do you call this, effect logic in such meetings. And you, you, you want to be very careful that you are an honest broker, that you have a very good moderator that lets uh, people speak. I cannot uh, spend too much time on that. There is a website that you can look at, uh, this transdisciplinarity.ch. And this is the website of the TVNet in Switzerland. And there are lots of methods and tools on, on that website. So, um, this is the end of the uh, first part of, of what I wanted to talk to you. And I suggest we can open a, a discussion on that. Is that okay? And then if we have still time, we can go on to Bovine TV, TV if you want. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, for folks who are just joining for the first time today, if you have a question, feel free to just directly unmute yourself or, or type it in the chat. And um, I've got a couple of questions to start out, off with. Um, you know, one important issue I think that you highlighted is um, that lifeways are endangered or, you know, uh, biocultural communities or to use the idiom of this group, multi-species communities or worlds. And, you know, power is often at play in, in these, these international um, uh, fields. But I, I think, you know, that's maybe more just sort of drawing out what I thought was a key um, insight from your presentation. Um, but also I wanted to drill down. Um, you said that the cladogram that we were looking at was from April and now we've, we've got a, a few more papers that have published. And for me, um, one of the ones that's potentially most disruptive of the stories that were told early in the pandemic just published a couple of weeks ago 
um, suggesting, well, finding evidence of SARS-CoV-2 an antibodies in about 11% of cancer patients in various parts of Italy. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you've read that paper and, and you know, how, how that relates to um, stories that, that tie this, this outbreak of the current disease to a particular place and a particular species. Well, <clears throat> uh, no, I, I haven't seen that. But um, this is an issue that we are dealing a lot in our institute because um, since 10 years, we have brought together the Institute of Preventive Medicine, Social and Preventive Medicine of the University of Basel. Uh, we have merged um, with Swiss TPH. That's why we are no longer called Swiss Tropical Institute. That's why we are called Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And these people brought in the whole non-communicable side cancer epidemiology, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and um, uh, all the noise and uh, pollution research. And um, uh, it is not surprising that cancer patients have, uh, are, uh, show antibodies uh, or are more susceptible. And I mean, most of the death in Switzerland have other co conditions. Most of them have any other, uh, in German we call it Vorkrankheit, uh, any, any condition that precedes or, or goes with it. And um, it is a fact that uh, uh, people who have diabetes are much more susceptible to, to, uh, to infectious disease. And they also suffer more from it because with many diseases you have, non-communicable diseases, you have chronic inflammation. So there is a weakened immune system, or there is also uh, an overreacting immune system. Actually, the, the severe feature of COVID is actually an overinflammation. And I mean, everybody thinks that um, cortisone, dexamethasone is such a new invention. But I, I use this all the time with acutely ill cows uh, 30 years ago in, in, in rural practice. And uh, if you have uh, acute mastitis in a cow, you inject also dexamethasone and the antibiotic to, to reduce the inflammation. But um, that doesn't surprise me at all. And um, this is one of the big issues uh, of uh, the severity or differences in severity in COVID um, uh, is the rate of old people, the proportion of old people, or actually um, the range of uh, other conditions. In Africa, mm -hmm. you have only about 2% of old, old people. And this is probably why um, COVID sweeps through Africa with much less severe conditions. Not, not without, but much less uh, severe conditions. My, my question was actually about the timeline and the geography of, of the outbreak. Um, so, so the paper was was looking at uh, samples taken from cancer patients like more than a year ago, so September 2019. So suggesting that the virus was widespread or, or at yeah. least not not well, necessarily in, in Wuhan as, as the outbreak site. So uh, um, I, I was just wondering if people in your circles are talking about this paper or not yet. I, I, I would really have to, to, to look it up, you know, but these were antibodies and, right. and I mean, antibodies are genetically much more difficult to characterize. And uh, I'm not sure if this is really, uh, is it really sure that it is um, COVID-19? You know, I tell you, serology is a mess. <laughs> hmm. I, I'm doing serology of brucellosis since, 20 years and it is a mess. Uh, um, uh, antibody specificity and sensitivity is, is uh, very, very statistical. And, um, uh, but um, one should wonder if we could not isolate those viruses from September 2019. That would be much more informative on what has really happened than only looking at antibodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's my my point here. Yeah. Interesting. You know, interesting. I, I'm sure that there would be samples from these patients. Yeah. And, and 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 I would guess possibly we could isolate virus from there. And 
I would um, much more count on evidence from isolated viruses from September 2019 rather than arguing with antibodies. That's okay. my recommendation on that. Interesting. So we've got two uh, questions in the stack here. So, uh, Frederic, do, do you want to ask uh, uh, your question, Frederic Keck from, mm -hmm. from France? Um, thanks, Eben. Uh, Jacob, I'm very interested uh, by your method of um, cost benefit assessment of um, uh, animal health uh, on, on the same basis as, as for human health. Um, and I'm curious to know if you, what is the method you use to assess the cost of surveillance? Because for the cost of vaccination of rabies, um, it, it, you, you can, you can uh, measure the cost of, of a campaign of vaccination. But for surveillance, it's, it's much more daily. It's, much, it's more like a routine. And maybe that's the reason why it's not um, so spectacular as vaccination that um, uh, public health doesn't, doesn't like to uh, present surveillance as, as a major measure. So, so can, how do you assess the, the, the cost of surveillance to show its, its benefits uh, for uh, public health? I mean, um, uh, thank you, Frédéric, and uh, c'est un grand plaisir de, de faire, faire votre connaissance en moins, en moins par Zoom. <laughs> where, where are you based, actually, Frederick? Are you in I'm, I'm based in Paris. Okay. And we, uh, we met at the Pasteur Institute a few uh, years ago. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, surveillance, uh, budget, uh, costing surveillance is not spectacular. Um, actually, you, you have essentially fixed, fixed cost, fixed cost, uh, for the veterinary services and for the public health services. And you have just to um, uh, sum this up, but the, the one, way, one way of, um, let's say, calculating, calculating uh, cost effectiveness of surveillance, uh, let us take this slide here. If you, if you find a human case, if you find a human case and uh, then the, uh, sorry, the bottom line is not marked, but it should be time. Then a lot of time has passed already when, when it took place in, in wildlife or in, anim, in, in, in domestic animals. So, if you find it already in domestic animals before it jumps over to, uh, to humans, you would have a reduced time to detection. This would be an uh, advantage over, over uh, separated surveillance systems, if they communicate, if they communicate. So I would estimate the um, time saving or reduced time to detection divided by the, the cost of that. And mm -hmm. uh, integrated surveillance can be more costly than separated surveillance because you have additional cost for the communication and the pull, putting everything together. It can be costlier. Mm -hmm. But we can make the thought experiment that if the virus would have been discovered be it in Italy or be it in, 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 in China, before it, it really jumped over to humans. And, and uh, th that would have been maybe a massive effort, but what we still uh, envision of uh, having a very, very closely monitored uh, integrated surveillance system, which would have been quite costly. But if you relate that to the cost of the outbreak we have now, it, it, is, uh, it is absolutely negligible. So, I mean, mm. this is my argument, especially with Corona, that uh, any, any, any surveillance system would have been cheaper than, mm -hmm. than the cost of the outbreak now. And this is also my argument for the future. Yeah. But um, mm. 
again, Frederick, we, we, you are absolutely right. We have to come up and prove these savings. Uh, let me just go to that picture with the Ethiopians. I mean, here, um, this, this man here, uh, Yaya Osman, he, this is his topic of PhD that he has to work out the incremental savings of, of, uh, integrated surveillance. Yeah. This is one of his topic. Yeah. And we hope to prove it with Rift Valley fever because there is endemic Rift Valley fever. There is endemic Q fever and there is also MERS in that area. Thank you. Um, Soraya has a, a related question about surveillance. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wonder about the surveillance. Um, so do you know what you have to survey? I mean, you know, what I wonder is, for instance, was it, could it have been, I mean, there are many, many viruses, right? So which one should I survey? I mean, can I predict what will become an issue like Corona um, SARS-2? Was this I mean, you know, so that's my question. I mean, you can survey when you know what to survey, but oh. what do you, how do you find out what to survey and how does not the decisive thing yeah. <laughs> it's all go through your net. Um, so yeah, but also the prediction, because I imagine that not every virus that may be harmful for humans is necessarily also shows up in a problematic way in whatever animal. So, so how can you, I mean, this is, looks like a sort of an endless surveillance system. Um, so how, how can you actually, the emerging, you call it emerging, right? So how do you define what is emerging? Yeah, uh, very, very good question. And um, if you had asked me five years ago, I, I would not have been able to answer it. But today I'm more optimistic because today I can have a full metagenome of a blood sample or of a fecal sample for 300 euros. And this is everything, basically everything. It's all, all the microbiota, but it's also all the risk, the, let's say all the drug resistance, or it's basically any pathogen can be found. And here I believe very much in the future of the digitalization of uh, machine learning of metagenomic data can basically identify anything with in short time periods that has a potential or is known to, to be potentially zoonotic. But uh, I fully agree with you. You know, um, in 1994, we had uh, uh, eight chimpanzees that died in Cote d'Ivoire in the Thai Forest Park. And I was in charge of that, um, the uh, Centre Suisse de Recherche Scientifique, the Swiss Research Center there. And I immediately told the students, don't touch the dead chimpanzees. But one, one uh, the project leader of that project, I can give his name, Christoph Bösch, overruled me. And he said, the next dead chimp, you will sample him. And the student that sampled that chimp got ill. And we first hospitalized him in, in Abidjan. And then the doctor started with antibiotics, then with antimalarials, and they came back to antibiotics. Then I evacuated that patient to Switzerland in an under pressure chamber, and he survived. And when he was released from the hospital, Le Geno in uh, Institut Pasteur in Paris released that this was uh, Ebola. So this was the first uh, Ebola uh, a discovery in West Africa, and it was a totally new strain. Uh, it, it was called the Ebola Cotiwar or Thai forest strain. And um, so actually what I want to explain with that it is human encroachment of, of, uh, of the environment is, is a risk. And, um, and if people touch wildlife and have this contact without protection, this is dangerous, and uh, there is so many viruses um, that can be there and can today quickly be analyzed. So I'm actually more optimistic than I was um, five or ten years ago, because the sequencing and um, uh, uh, machine learning has so much progressed uh, towards um, rapid identification um, 
of a needle within a massive haystack. So what you would see would be a concentration of a particular peak or something that sort of, or, or you would see it in humans, which <laughs> you haven't seen in, in, in animals before, or something like this? Well, um, what you can do, for example, you would go on a wildlife market in, in, uh, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, where they sell wildlife, you sample them, and you met, do the metagenome, and you check for any, any um, potential human pathogen. And you look what is circulating. Interestingly, during uh, pandemic, uh, during outbreak, um, during periods between outbreaks of Ebola, nobody finds Ebola. This is absolutely crazy. Uh, we currently don't know where Ebola hides uh, between outbreaks. So, Raya, I, I, this is the, the way I would do it, but you're absolutely right. This is uh, enigma, and uh, uh, I don't know how we can do it. And that's uh, and here I make a little bracket to Alfred North Whitehead. This is the emergence in Alfred North, North Whitehead's process philosophy. These are emergent phenomena that can happen uh, in these entities, in these operational entities, and they are not predictable, actually. And um, that's what I like. That, that's why I like uh, Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy, because it is much more, much closer to, to the current uh, complexity that we are facing than Cartesian mechanistic thinking. Yeah. So we've got uh, four minutes left and three questions. So I'm gonna suggest a speed round where we do each, each of the super quick questions, try to keep it less than a minute. So we've got uh, Melanie, Kevin and uh, uh, Stephanie. Okay, this is, this is going to be a challenge, but let me try. Um, you, you, emphasis, you put emphasis in your paper that um, there shouldn't be any compromise to economic activities. And I understand that on a small scale, like looking at the farmers and the, the, um, the, people, the people on your images, but um, how, this is, how this is going to work on a bigger scale, I'm interested to um, hear more about your thoughts. And especially given that one has approach on, human, on humans and animals, but with something like, like coronaviruses, it seems that um, issues like the destruction of biodiversity and habitats play such a huge role because um, they create these spillover zones um, that I, I would, I mean, in the, looking at you at the timeline that you present in figure one would come before you start with the presence of pathogens in wildlife sectors. So, you know, would, would it be possible to bring in that moment in time that, that, that comes before the, um, the pathogens, the pathogens are present and um, yeah, and then, then um, looking again at this question of, of the economic impact and economic changes. Look, the so, so Kevin has actually yielded his time to Melanie. So, so Jakob, why don't, why don't you reply and then we'll come back to Whitehead with Stephanie. Should I answer? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, Melanie, um, you know, um, epidemiologists and virologists, um, they they have the knowledge on how this virus transmits and they come up with solutions of interrupting transmission most effectively. And in Switzerland, they pleaded for a massive lockdown uh, very early, already in February. But the government can not only look at the, at the uh, illness, they, they have also to look at the economy. And basically, we have to negotiate how many ill people or even dead people can we afford against a massive economic breakdown, which is also killing people, actually. And you see it now, uh, because of COVID, we have extra malaria mortality, we have extra HIV mortality, because these services break down. So uh, we need... We need that societal um, uh, discussion. We need to uh, discuss between academic specialists and societal stakeholders. What are the acceptable solutions or the acceptable risks? 
that we take uh, to control the disease. So at the end, uh, uh, any government has to make a difficult decision between how many how many deaths are we accepting against how much economic decline are we accepting? And this is a, for me, I think it's still a dilemma, although many economists also say um, not controlling the disease properly is in as much uh, economic, leads to economic decline. But uh, still, I, I think this is the difficulty we are in. Does that answer your question? Or? or at least goes in the direction. So, uh, uh, Stephanie, I would personally love to hear your question. Jakob, if, if you're willing to stay an extra five minutes, Stephanie no says her question's too big for the time available, but okay. I personally would love to, to hear it. Yeah, what, what I suggested, uh, if you want, we can have another session later on. I mean, sure. we, yeah. We, and we could also read Whitehead together. I would I would love to... Have, you know, yes. have guided guided reading of Whitehead. You know, Whitehead for the pandemic could be a really fun se session. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Stephanie, do do you want to ask ask the question while it's while it's fresh? Sure. Um, thank you. So thank you so much for this talk. I was not aware of um, a One Health initiative before, but it sounds so promising and interesting. Um, so thank you again for for your talk. My question. Um, I'm also a student of Whitehead and, and of process philosophy. Um, and, uh, you know, just recognizing up front that all research right, faces certain disciplinary constraints and, and, and sort of norms, um, of course, acknowledging that, you know, uh, at the outset. But I wondered from the way I tend to think of things, um, you know, from a process perspective to, to sort of encapsulate value uh, within the monetary terms. Um, would be to, in a way, right, it sort of captures um, some of the really important potential that comes from this way of thinking, right, which is much more expansive and interconnected. It, it captures it into capitalist terms that we know are unsustainable, right, and sort of um, exacerbating the kinds of uh, harms that you're studying. So uh, I suspect, and of course, I'd love, I'd love to hear, perhaps I'm wrong, I suspect that there are some um, forces that require you perhaps to, to, to think in terms of cost and benefit and to present the, you know, the research in those terms. But I wondered if there has been any interest or effort in um, uh, c conceptualizing value a little bit differently, such that, um, right, it's not only dollars and cents that are being measured, but also certain kinds of experiences of value, right, that can't really be reduced to, to dollars. Yeah. Uh, these are externalities that can hardly be monetized, and um, you are fully right. Let me, uh, uh, I mean, at the moment, I am uh, working on uh, or thinking about the game theory of one health or a game theory of, of health and, uh, and, and sustainability. And I'm inspired by Elinor Ostrom um, about the commons, and I argue that. Uh, absence of disease should be a common, a commons. And then it would fit in Ostrom's theory. And then um, there are important philosophical uh, issues ar around that because most of the game theory is so-called non-cooperative that people wouldn't talk to each other. But Ostrom says, but people are talking to each other. And um, I can just grab another book on my desk. Um, this is um, uh, John, John Römer. I don't know if you know John Römer. Uh, John Römer is, uh, it's about how we cooperate. And uh, look what is written on the bottom. Ah, let me, let me stand and then I, I think it will reflect better. I think uh, your background's taking over the book. Ah. <laughs> It, it, it's a theory of Kantian optimization. And I think uh, Kant says, uh, don't uh, uh, only do those things that will not, um, that you want the others also do. So the categorical imperative. And, and, and this is my point. I think um, uh, a Kantian cooperation could be um, more beneficial to the whole planet if we would commonly think about that and uh, that that is very close to the to the 
Jewish uh, Decalogue, and uh, and uh, and uh, this is the, the direction where I I go. And uh, I would say, if we if we understand that we must cooperate uh, locally, but also internationally to control the Corona crisis, actually. The COVID showed a disaster in international cooperation, and we, we must definitely cooperate better. And here I have experience with rabies. I mean, rabies was on, could only be eliminated because of very strong international cooperation in Europe. If Germany, Switzerland, France, Italy, Austria didn't cooperate, we were, would never have been able to eliminate rabies. And it's the same with cor Corona. And I mean, just a little bracket. Those who know how to control epidemics are the vets. I mean, they have much more to deal with <laughs> epidemics than, than the normal uh, medics. And they are not asked. They are not asked. But to come back to your point, my, my vision is that we could develop a game theory that shows the tangibles and intangibles in, in what you say of benefits from cooperating in terms of finances, but also uh, ecosystem services, uh, societal stability, uh, and so on, that can result from a better cooperation. Look, the whole international migration, if we would cooperate better, this could be attenuated massively. Health is just one example. Climate change is another. This week, uh, last week, I was drilling my geothermal. So next week, we are independent of uh, Ru Russian gas. <laughs> so I think this is the contribution of our generation to reduce the carbon footprint. Yeah. So this is the direction where I think we should go. And it's not only, um, it's actually benefits of cooperation in, in, in all directions. And health is a good example, but not the only one. And, and I think that contextual vulnerability is, is so important. You know, the World Health Organization is, is talking about contextual vulnerability as something to investigate right now. But I think, you know, amidst this really interesting intersection of, of Whiteheadian philosophy and, you know, all, all the different transdisciplinary perspectives you bring in, I, I think um, you're really getting at important things. So it sounds like there, we've got consensus that we want to do a, a week on Whitehead. So uh, I'll, I'll probably rely on, on you, Jakob and Stephanie and others uh, who are ex more expert on Whitehead to identify good texts. We could um, identify, yeah, please propose a text. I can also propose a text and then we could discuss it. Sounds great. So, so thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, been a delight to reconnect and um, let's uh, keep the conversation going. Yeah. And uh, I don't forget that we want to develop projects. <laughs> we will. We will. Yeah. <laughs> Grants are being written. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All, right. all the best. Have a nice Thanks. evening. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.